Audio 1.1 1. They're much better organised than they used to be. 2. The more we rush around, the more stressed we get. 3. I waited as long as I could. 4. Events are moving far more quickly than we expected. Audio 1.2 The management of change is one of the most difficult things for organisations to do well. Many people feel threatened by change and fear of the unknown means workers often prefer things to stay as they are. Managers, in turn, are often anxious about communicating change. This may mean that they don't communicate appropriately or that the team picks up on their anxiety and becomes nervous in turn. Audio 1.3 People in different cultures do not respond in the same way to approaches to change management. Factors which affect the way people react include how much respect people have for power and those in authority and the importance of the individual versus the group. Another key factor would be how people react towards uncertainty, not being sure what is going to happen. If managers fail to take these factors into account, they may find workers are highly resistant to change. Audio 1.4 German-American psychologist Kurt Levine one of the pioneers of organisational psychology devised a three-step model for the effective management of change. The first step, which he calls unfreezing, concerns explaining why things should be done in another way. This step is very important, and a particular approach may be more effective in one culture than another. In Anglo-Saxon countries, it's important to show how change will benefit the individual, if people can see that doing things a different way will help their career or bring a reward, they are more likely to respond positively. In Scandinavia and the Netherlands, people like to feel a high level of autonomy in their work and believe that they, not managers, fully understand their work. In this culture, consultation and decision-making by the team is very important. In countries such as Mexico, Russia and India, People believe that the person at the top of the company has a good overview and can make the best decisions. Communication of change should also be done formally, through written documents. In Germany and Austria, the emphasis is on being an expert. An expert is believed to be in a position to define new directions. Therefore, anyone who wants to implement change must first ensure that their knowledge and expertise is recognised. It's not enough just being a manager. The next step in Levine's model is known as... What Audio 1.5 When we think of the world's biggest cities, we might think of places like Tokyo or Mexico City. While these are certainly big, the map shows us the six fastest growing cities in the world and the cities which are likely to continue growing rapidly from now till 2020. None of them are in Europe or the Americas. Five of them are in Asia and one is in Africa. The world's fastest growing city in terms of population is Beihai in the Guangxi region of China. Its location near Vietnam, Hong Kong and Macau has aided its economic development and tourism is also on the increase. Its average population growth from 2006 to 2020 is estimated to be nearly 11% per year. Surat and Ghaziabad are both important industrial cities in India. Bamako, the capital of Mali, is a centre for shipping and industry, which has grown due to rural migration, as has Kabul in Afghanistan. The ancient city of Sana'a in the Middle Eastern country of Yemen has existed for more than 2,500 years but has grown recently due to the oil industry.
Audio 1.6. Shanghai has changed enormously in the last 30 years or so. I mean, it's really grown a lot. There are now just under 24 million people living here. That's double the population of the late 80s. So the past 30 years or so have seen some big changes. I think the area that's undergone the most dramatic change is probably Pudong. It used to be a rural area, but it's been completely transformed. They've built an incredible number of skyscrapers, and the skyline has changed beyond recognition. A lot of the big financial institutions, which used to be in the Bund, that's another district. Well, they've moved to Pudong. You've got the Shanghai Tower, that's the tallest building in China, and Pudong is also where the airport is now. There are loads of shops, museums, and restaurants. It's a really lively part of the city. But it's not just the center of the city that's changed. The way Shanghai is growing means they're constantly putting up new tower blocks and residential areas all over town. I know some people aren't happy about being moved out of their old houses, but I think the quality of housing has improved a lot, and most people see it as something positive. I suppose in some ways I think it's becoming more westernized or maybe more globalized. You see all the same stores and chains you would in London or New York. I think it's also getting a lot more expensive because of this. There's also a much bigger middle class. I absolutely love what's happened in the waterfront area. That's all really changed. They always seem to be building a new expressway or widening an existing one. The metro's great. It's now got what something like twelve lines, and I think they're building or planning to build somewhere in the region of seven more. That's a big improvement. One thing that hasn't changed too much, though, is the pollution. Shanghai's a lot better than Beijing, but the air quality is still not that great. But Shanghai is a much greener city than it used to be. They've established a green belt, and there are dozens of parks now, a lot more than there used to be. And there doesn't seem to be any sign of it stopping. More people are moving to Shanghai all the time. Audio one point seven. One, we're living in a period of great transformation. Two, the internet has brought great benefits, but also many problems. Three, change in modern life is being accompanied more and more by a sense of nostalgia. Four. Future generations will look back on the present day as one of enormous technological advances. Audio two point one. Welcome to Everyday Nature, a weekly look at the world around us. Today we have three zoologists who are going to tell us about animals and their astonishing powers. Let's start with you, Dr. Marshall. What's your area of interest? Okay, so I've been investigating sound. There are some pretty noisy animals around. For example, the lion has a seriously loud roar, which can be heard eight kilometers away. And isn't there a kind of shrimp which makes an awfully big click? That's right. It's called the snapping shrimp, and it makes an astonishingly loud snap that lasts for just one millisecond. But it's so loud and powerful that it heats up the water around it to a temperature hotter than the sun's surface. But the blue whale is the most impressive of all. Its calls travel more than one thousand six hundred kilometers through the ocean, and are roughly as loud as a very loud rock concert. But we humans are unable to hear it, right? <laughs> That's right. Professor Green, I believe your field is building. There are some notably good builders out there in the animal world. Am I right? Oh yes. Just think of a bird's nest, for example. It's so remarkably complex and beautiful that it was used as the model for the Olympic Stadium in Beijing. But I think it's beaten by the termites' nest, which is utterly astonishing. 
It's more like a city than a nest. It involves highly sophisticated systems. Did you know that inside the environment is temperature controlled with special ventilation? So it's air conditioned. It certainly is, and what's more, there are special rooms that store food, contain gardens, 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 and of course house the queen. It's an exceedingly impressive piece of work, and just made from simple materials like soil and saliva. So, Dr. Johns, you study animals from which point of view? Well, I'm particularly interested in how fast animals can travel. But also how long they can travel at the fastest speeds. For example, some birds, especially hunting birds like the peregrine falcon, are extraordinarily fast over a short distance, even up to 320 kilometers an hour. If they want to catch a mouse, for example, but they can't sustain that over several minutes. And it's fair to say that humans are hopelessly slow when it comes to running and swimming and so on, isn't it? That's true, but we do have a critically important advantage, which is that we can run for long distances, much farther than any other animal. It's because we have a radically different body structure, and being able to run for a long time can give you advantages that pure speed doesn't have. Not least, you can win marathon races. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Johns, Professor. Audio two point two. Hello and welcome to In My Opinion, the radio show in which three contestants have just sixty seconds to present the best answer to a topical question. And of course, as usual, our audience here in the studio will vote after hearing the three speakers. Our first question tonight is: What was the most significant breakthrough in engineering? And over now to our first contender, Marion. Your sixty seconds starts now. Good evening. In my opinion, the most significant breakthrough in engineering was the wheel. Until the invention of the wheel in Mesopotamia about six thousand years ago. Early humans had made pots by hand,、um, dressed in animal fur, and pulled heavy objects from place to place. How inefficient! But even once they'd invented the wheel, its use was limited to things like making pots.、Um, in fact, early humans had been using the wheel for three hundred years before they realised they could use it to transport both themselves and heavy objects.、Um, But the wheel is not just about transport; it's had a huge impact on many later inventions.、Um, without the wheel, inventions such as the watch, the car, or the computer would have been impossible. Thank you, Marion. Now over to Trevor. Your sixty seconds starts now. Thanks. Well, in my opinion, the most important breakthrough was. Electricity. In the past hundred years, engineering is said to have produced some of its greatest achievements to date, and、uh, the key to most of these is electricity. Electricity has revolutionised、uh, virtually every aspect of modern life. Its use became widespread at the end of the nineteenth century, and it has been. Transforming our lives ever since. Can you imagine our life today without it? That sounds like it from Trevor. Now on to our final contestant in this first round, Lucy. Lucy, your time on the most significant breakthrough in engineering starts now. Okay. Well, my answer to the question is a little unusual. You see, in my opinion, the most significant breakthrough has not yet happened. According to the National Academy for Engineering in the USA, some of the biggest breakthroughs are predicted to have taken place by the middle of the 21st century, and I think the most significant is that experts say that by 2040 we will have found new types of fuel. This could have a dramatic effect on our current problems with energy supply and the environment. 
Some say that in just a few decades, new energy sources will have been developed through nanotechnology, the engineering of matter at the level of molecules. And that's a really... Sorry to interrupt, Lucy. I'm afraid your time's up. And now, having heard our three speakers, it's over to our audience to decide who... Audio 2.3 1. Early humans had been using the wheel for 300 years before they realised they could use it to transport both themselves and heavy objects. 2. Electricity has revolutionised virtually every aspect of modern life. 3. Some of the biggest breakthroughs are predicted to have taken place by the middle of the 21st century. 4. In just a few decades, new energy sources will have been developed. Audio 2.4 1. Most of the patients are asleep at this time, so it's important that you don't... 2. This music is so loud. I just can't work in. 3. When I'm working, I have to have... 4. He's a very shy kind of guy. When he's at a party and he doesn't know anybody, he finds it difficult to... Audio 2.5 1. Eric, could you stop fiddling with your phone, please? This is supposed to be a serious meeting. I wish you would... 2. You mean you can see somebody standing on that bridge in the valley? I can't see anything. You must have... 3. Haven't you noticed that my husband speaks with a Mexican accent and I speak with a Spanish accent? Or maybe you don't. 4. Now, Lucas, when you said that there is no relationship between the two events, I thought that was a very... Audio 2.6 1. Do you ever have to take notes? Uh, yes, I usually take notes in business meetings at work. And do you have a particular way of doing that? I usually make notes about the agenda. I use the agenda items as headings, and I highlight the action points, particularly mine, so I don't forget what to do for the next meeting. 2. Can you tell me if you ever have to take notes? Oh, yeah, all the time, in lectures and seminars, things like that. Have you ever been trained how to take notes? Not really. I just picked it up through practice. And your top tip? I guess it would be to listen for key words. And how do you know what the key words are? They're usually stressed in some way. Like, the lecturer says, so it was the economic situation rather than the political. So you know to write economic. 3. So tell me how you take notes. Uh, my technique is to write down everything. Really? Everything? Yes, because you never know what information you're going to need later. Do you even write down words like and and the? Um, well, yes. Four. Hi, we're doing some research into how people take notes. OK, well, I take notes at meetings usually. And do you have any particular technique or strategy? Um, not really. I just type straight onto a tablet. I can type much faster than I can write. And you put down everything? Um, I never write details. Things like statistics or examples. 5. Any advice for note-taking? Well, when I was at school, I was taught a lot of abbreviations, like the plus sign for and, and three dots for therefore, and so on. And I found that to be really useful. Also, bullet points are great. 
because if you're writing a list, you can make it very clear which are the items on the list and which is extra information. So, you have a special system? Not really. I don't think it matters what your system is, as long as you can reconstruct the lecture from your notes afterwards. 6. You've been studying here for a couple of years now, so I guess you've been to a load of lectures. Sure have. And talks and seminars. And have you developed a particular way of taking notes? Not especially. But I find it's very useful to try and listen for the structure of the argument. The best lecturers really signal the direction their talk is going. So I would say listen out for discourse markers, linkers and conjunctions. Such as? Things like because and therefore and in addition. Also words and phrases which introduce examples. Then I use little symbols like three dots for because, or eg for an example, or a plus sign for in addition. It's easy to get confused and not be sure if something is an example or a new point. Audio 2.7 One of the most amazing feats of the human brain is that of hearing and listening. Of these, I think that listening is the more mysterious. Don't get me wrong, hearing is an incredible feat too. The human ear is a complex and wonderful organ, but we understand more or less how it works. That is to say, we understand it from the medical or biological point of view. The transformation of sound into electrical signals to the brain is reasonably well understood, and, of course, there are many animals, including famously bats, who have much superior hearing mechanisms to humans. In fact, if you think about it... Audio 2.8 In fact, if you think about it, we have been able to build machines that can hear for many years. Scientists are now getting interested in the skill of listening. Because machines, and we're talking about computers now, actually find it tougher to listen than to hear. You can tell the difference if you listen to a recording of a noisy party. You can hear lots of different sounds, the chatter of people engaging in conversation, the sound of glasses clinking, maybe music too, but they all sound the same volume or loudness. It's not possible to notice any real difference between them. But we can. When we're at a party, we can focus or concentrate on the conversation we're having and cut out or ignore the music or other background noise. In other words, we can sort out what is important to us and what isn't. In the same way, computers are good at certain aspects of listening to music. Computers can distinguish rhythm. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And they can tell if a note is high or low. Da! Duh. Some computers can now even tell the difference between a violin and a piano. A scientist called... Audio 2.9 A scientist called Maunya El-Hilali and a group of university researchers are working on this. They're trying to find out how the human brain perceives all these different sounds in a noisy environment. Whether you're at work, in the street, or in the home, you're surrounded by a cacophony of sounds, and all these sounds compete for your attention. How does the brain deal with this? The researchers claim there are two types of activity going on in the brain when you're listening in these environments. The first hears all the sounds, but the second can zero in, can focus on a particular sound, like the conversation you are engaged in, and that is controlled by your state of mind. The scientists hope to understand the relationship between these two activities. The immediate aim of the research is to build a computer model which can listen in the same way as a human. But the eventual aim is to design better products that will improve and enhance communication. Audio 2.10
This leads us on to a consideration of the conventional thinking about what a challenge actually is. For most of us, the meaning usually centres around an individual task, which is in some way demanding or difficult to complete. Physical or mental tasks commonly spring to mind, and the outcome is often clearly a success or a failure without much scope for any grey areas in the middle. So we can probably all recognise that feats such as running a marathon, climbing a mountain or crossing the Grand Canyon on a tightrope present enormous challenges to the individual. They require physical and mental resilience that most of us cannot identify with and potentially offer a sense of achievement that is likely to contribute exponentially to the well-being of the individual. However, some definitions suggest a wider meaning and that a challenge may additionally involve the testing of abilities and character. There may not be an obvious end point, any recognisable achievement or an attempt which ends in disappointment. We can therefore include the everyday chores we face day after day within our concept of a challenge. And these daily challenges should be seen in a different way to the one-off tasks that arise from time to time in our lives. Audio 2.11 How many of you have children? Quite a few, I see. And how many of you have lost a loved one? Not so many, but still a significant minority. What about a new job? How many of you have started a new job in the last two or three years? Yes, quite a few too. And how many of you received emotional or psychological support while these life events were happening? Hmm, not so many. Of course, that's not surprising. Very few people seek help during times of change such as these. It's generally only when things become catastrophic for the individual that they make the effort to seek out help or coping strategies. For example, the new mother who can no longer cope due to postnatal depression. For most of us, these are events that people live through all the time. They are part and parcel of human existence. Perhaps people shouldn't need extra attention or support. They might appear weak. But is this a sensible attitude? Should we expect people to soldier on regardless? In my view, no. Through my research, I've gathered concrete evidence that people who find themselves in a life-changing scenario are much less prone to stress or depression when given support and coping strategies from the outset. I've looked at medical data from the last 50 years and at the beginning of this period, Concerns with mental health and associated terms, such as counselling and coaching, were significantly less common than they are today. But this relative absence of help in the past has allowed me to see the differences in how effectively those both with and without support during significant changes in life go on to deal with their issues. Audio 2.12 Achievements Challenges Tests Successful Audio 2.13 OK, so I guess my biggest achievement so far is probably getting into university. I was a good student in my early teens but I kind of slacked off a bit at about 16, and then I suddenly realised that exams were just around the corner, so I really had a lot of catching up to do, which presented a challenge. However, I was determined to get into university, so I suppose that gave me the incentive. For years, my parents had been telling me to study, but in the end, making the decision for myself was what made all the difference, and so I organised myself and tackled the problem and got the grades I needed. When I heard I'd got in, I was utterly amazed. I've done other things since, but at the time, it really was an incredible achievement.
Audio 2.14 My brother and I had always wanted to have our own taxi company, but it wasn't easy. Things kept going wrong. Financing the business was hard and so was finding the right staff. At first, we couldn't think what to do, but eventually we decided the best way to sort things out was to open a cooperative with other drivers. Of course, getting everything organised wasn't easy. There was a lot of hard work. However, we managed to launch our business last March. It was a source of tremendous satisfaction when we finally achieved our goal. Audio 2.15 I guess I reckon Utterly Sort of Dreadful Unbelievable You know what I mean? Ridiculous. All the time. I suppose. Anyway. Extremely. Kind of. Audio 3.1 1. What's the matter, Jack? I've just been talking to Meriel, and apparently the company that supplies those handbags, which are so popular, has gone bankrupt. So somebody has to ring about 50 customers to tell them they can't have the handbags they ordered. They're not going to be happy. Oh, I can do that. Maybe I can persuade them to buy something else. Oh, thanks, Natasha. You're an angel. You never mind doing work that other people don't want to do. I don't know what I'd do without you. Two. So we have to make this group presentation next week. That's right. And we all want to make sure it's really good, yeah? Of course, yeah. So no making jokes when we're supposed to be working. I want it to be top class. So do we, Jade. We're right with you on that. Three. How's your new colleague? Marcel? He's OK. He works really hard, and he's very pleasant to everybody and all that. The trouble is, he's a bit of a me, me, me person. How do you mean? Well, you know, when we have a meeting and someone's speaking, he's always tapping his pen on the table. Or making little jokes or something like that. You get the feeling that he can't stand it when the spotlight's on somebody else. And he wears the most extraordinary clothes. Sometimes I think he'd rather be a model than a sales rep. Four. How are you getting on with the new administrator? I really don't like him. He seems very friendly at first. But then he keeps making nasty little remarks about other people in the department. Little bits of gossip. But he doesn't say anything to your face. It's like he's trying to set people off against each other. Not nice. Audio 3.2 So, now we're going to move on to have a quick look at the work of Glenn M. Parker who is a business expert who spent 30 years studying and writing about how teams work, or don't work. <laughs> and Parker says that the perfect team has a balance between different personality types. Ideally, and I do stress that we are talking about the ideal team, not what happens in real-life situations, we would have four different roles. The first of these we call the contributor. And this role is that of the person who is interested in technical detail. They provide data and information to the team, and they really get the team to concentrate on short-term tasks. This person is usually very dependable and punctual. 
They often carry a notepad with them to write down key ideas. Have you encountered this kind of person? I can see people nodding, so I guess you have. And finally, they have high expectations of the team. They expect quality work. They are task-oriented. The second role is called the collaborator, and this person is very much the visionary. They have a clear idea of the long-term mission of the team. They focus on the long-term outcomes. This individual is a big-picture person. They're often high-spirited and help to boost the morale of the team. You might think they would act very inflexibly, but they don't. They're actually very flexible and open to new ideas. They're also willing to get their hands dirty, and they do so to achieve the team's goals. The third role is that of the communicator. This kind of individual really cares about how people get along with each other, how well they communicate with each other, and they want to build a positive, relaxed atmosphere. They're the kind of person who, if you ask them to organize a party or a social activity for the team, then they will do, and happily. They possess excellent communication skills. They're very open, and they have a sense of humor. The fourth and final role is that of challenger. Do note that another word for the challenger is troublemaker, so are you convinced this is a good person to have on the team? <laughs> well, neither was I, but I've come to realize that rather than being just a pain in the neck, in fact, they do play a crucial part because they question the goals and processes of the team. They are willing to disagree, even with the leader, and they ask tough questions. They are never satisfied with the outcomes. They push the team to take risks and be more creative. Audio 3.3 1. I was waiting for you. 2. Where do you want to go tonight? 3. I had got the time of our appointment wrong. 4. We've heard there's a strike on public transport. 5. But did you make trouble for him? 6. She has been to the doctor. Audio 3.4 1. Why didn't you wait for me at the station? I was waiting for you. Didn't you see me? 2. Where do you want to go tonight? Let's phone George and see if he fancies going bowling. 3. So did you manage to meet up with Hattie? No, it was a disaster. I had got the time of our appointment wrong, just as I thought, so we never saw each other. 4. Why are we going by taxi? We've heard there's a strike on public transport. 5. David accused me of making trouble for him at work. That's not a very nice thing to say. But did you make trouble for him? 6. Why didn't Lucy go to the doctor? She has been to the doctor. She went yesterday morning. Audio 3.5 OK, so Tracy has asked us to go through these questionnaires and come up with the best ideas for better communication between the departments. So, am I right in thinking that we have to list as many ideas as possible? No, I think we should restrict it in some way. I agree. Let's brainstorm first, then choose the best ideas from that list. Sorry, I don't follow you. What do you mean? What I'm saying is, we put all the ideas together, then choose four? That sounds good. I wrote down a few ideas already. OK, let's hear them. So, first up, a lot of people said, how about meetings between the departments? OK, but some of the departments have 20 staff. How would that work? Well, they'd have to choose somebody to attend. In other words, each department would send one person. Are you with me? And this group of people, one from each department, 
would meet regularly. Is that what you mean? Yes, maybe once a week. Sounds good. It's pretty simple to organise. Next idea? Uh, the next one, which loads of people mentioned, was for more socialising between departments, like more social events, you know, cinema trips or meeting up after work. And there was a suggestion for team building weekends. Oh, yeah, brilliant. That's great. Let's put that down. Hold on. What did you mean when you said there was a suggestion for team building weekends? You know, where we all go away to a hotel for the weekend and play silly games. Oh, no. I can't think of anything worse. It all sounds way too wishy-washy to me. Uh, I beg your pardon? <sighs> Let me rephrase that. What I meant was that not everybody would enjoy that sort of thing. But going out after work is fine. OK, let's not put in team-building weekends. So, that's two ideas so far. I thought the idea of job rotation between departments was a really good one. Oh, cool, yeah. Then I could spend a week in the sales department trying to work out what they do all day. Sorry, what was that again? <laughs> I'm joking. But I think job rotation's a great idea. Me too. You would really find out what other people are thinking. OK, we need one more. I've got a couple of ideas from the questionnaires I read. One would be for an in-house social media feed, like a Facebook page, where anybody from any department could contribute ideas and suggestions. Hmm, maybe. And the other? The last one was some kind of system where each department has to email all the other departments each week with information about what they're doing. I think that just repeats the weekly meeting. I prefer the social media idea. Me too. Everybody knows how to use Facebook these days. <laughs> Great. That's four ideas. Now we just need to write the proposal. Audio 3.6 Expressions for checking Am I right in thinking that... Sorry, I don't follow you. What did you mean when you said... Is that what you mean? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry, what was that again? Expressions for rephrasing. What I'm saying is... In other words, what I meant was, let me rephrase that. I'll put that another way. Expressions to check if the listener has understood. Do you follow? Are you with me? Do you understand so far? Audio 4.1 1. You should have heard Gavin from accounts this morning. Why? What was it this time? Well, he came down here to use the photocopier and somebody had left it jammed again. Uh-oh. What did he say? Well, you can imagine. Who did this? Is anyone going to own up? As if anyone was going to confess with him going on like that. I bet I know who's to blame for it. That Michael. He's useless with machines. I really don't feel any of us can be held responsible. We all know the machine's at least ten years old. They need to get a new one. Simple as that. Two. OK. Hi, everyone. Welcome to English Now. I'm the welfare officer here, and my name's Maria. I'm responsible for everything to do with your accommodation and also things like health, banking and so on. If you have any problems with your host family or need to know anything about local transport or where to get a SIM card for your mobile phone, I'm the person to see. I'm also in charge of reservations for the social program, so if you want to sign up for any of the trips or activities on offer, come and let me know. 3. Well, Scott... 
The reason I've called you in today is that we'd like you to take care of the Miller account from now on. Miller? But that's one of our biggest customers. Indeed. Which is why we feel you're the man for the job. You'll answer to Melanie, and you need to keep her informed about what's going on. But you're trustworthy and reliable, and we know we can count on you to get the job done. Wow, I uh, don't know what to say. I mean, thanks. It's a real vote of confidence. Um, yes, I'd be delighted to take it on. I hope I don't let you down. I'm sure you won't. Audio 4.2 One. I think there's something wrong with the remote control. <laughs> you mean you've dropped it again? Do you have to be so? Two. I'm not happy about you driving tonight. The roads are really icy. Don't worry. I'll be fine. Well... Three. Just look at you! Green hair, long black clothes, and all that jewellery. <sighs> Whatever will the neighbours think? People should judge you on the person you are, not what you look like. As for the neighbours... Four. Right, so apart from the salary, what benefits are there? OK, so as part of the package, you get four weeks holiday, free parking and private... Audio 4.3 1. Could you tell us a bit about your job? Well, I'm a warden at a sheltered housing complex. That's a kind of supported residential option for older people. The people who live here are all retired, they all have their own flat, and they don't tend to have any major healthcare issues. But they're also reaching a point in their lives when it's kind of comforting to have someone available, just in case they have any difficulties. I'm on duty three nights a week. I have a colleague who covers other nights, and I'm around during the day. I don't go round unless I'm asked, but the residents know that I'm on hand should they need anything. This can be small things like helping them change a light bulb, or taking care of minor maintenance jobs that need to be done, say if something gets broken, through to helping in the event of some kind of medical emergency. OK, so you're in what could be termed a caring profession. What does caring mean to you? Well, in this job, I think it's about allowing people to have their independence, but knowing that there is somebody who does care and is there if they need it. And the qualities needed for your job? Well... You need to be patient. You need to be a good listener. Some people in this situation can be a little lonely, but I think you also need to have respect for people's independence and privacy. Yes, I think that's the most important thing, really. 2. What do you do? I'm a human resources manager. I have a background in psychology, and I was hired because of this. So, although HR, human resources, could be seen as just part of a business, for me it's very much a, a caring profession. And what does your job entail? Well, we work in various different areas, like recruitment, taking on new staff, contracts, staff development and so on. But I think one of the most important things for me is staff welfare, making sure that people feel good and are looked after, because I think happy people will do their job better. We encourage our staff to come in and talk about any problems or concerns they may have, and these tend to be work-related, contracts, pay and so on, but sometimes staff members come and talk to me about more personal matters, other things that might be having an impact on their work. Hmm. So what does caring mean to you? I think being a good carer is about being a good listener. I think it's important to listen well and to be present. That is, not distracted by your own stuff when someone's talking to you. OK. So apart from that, are there any other qualities you need in this job? The other thing is total discretion. 
People often talk about very personal or private issues. My relationship with them is a professional one, so it's important to keep that conversation private and to be careful that anything they say is treated in complete confidence. Audio 4.4 I'm on duty three nights a week. I have a colleague who covers other nights. And I'm around during the day. I don't go round unless I'm asked, but the residents know that I'm on hand should they need anything. Audio 4.5 According to a nurse who works with elderly people, there is a pattern of things they commonly regret when they look back on their life. Every male patient she met shared the same wish, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. They felt they always put work before wives and children and regretted missing out on their children's youth. Another commonly shared feeling was, I wish I'd stayed in touch with friends. People felt they'd been so focused on their own lives and responsibilities that they'd let good friendships slip by over the years. The most frequently expressed wish was, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Many people had ignored their own feelings in order to satisfy the wishes of others. As a result, they had a strong sense of frustration that so many of their dreams had gone unfulfilled. Audio 4.6 Understanding Word Boundaries 1. When one word finishes in a consonant sound and the next starts with a vowel sound, we often join the words together. For example, It's all about. 2. When one word finishes in D or T and the next starts with a consonant, we usually omit the d or t. For example, just perfect. 3. When one word finishes in a vowel sound and the next starts with a vowel sound, we insert y, r, or w. For example, the other, care of, do it. Audio 4.7 Oh, I meant to tell you. I read this great blog post the other day. It was just perfect for you. Why? What do you mean? Well, it was on a blog called The Freedom Experiment by this life coach. Mm, life coach? Makes me suspicious straight away. <laughs> no, listen. It's all about getting rid of your to-do list and doing uninhibited and liberating things instead. Audio 4.8 Now, you just keep your hands off my to-do list. <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> now, there are some things that I know you're not going to like. Like what? Like invent an illness and call in sick. Yeah, you're right. That's just irresponsible. Or climb a tree and sit there all day. Right. <laughs> yeah, but there are also some good ones. Such as? Let's see. Throw out your TV. Now, you've been saying for ages how much time we waste watching nonsense. Well, that's true enough. OK, here's another. Drop at least one obligation. I mean, we all go round worrying about all our responsibilities and half the time we don't even stop to question the things we do. Yeah, you've got a point. Now, what about this one, number 77? Jump on a train to somewhere. Anywhere. I like the spontaneity of that. Just go to the station and see where fate takes you. Yeah, but don't you think this is all a bit... I don't know... Carefree? Adventurous? No, I was thinking more on the lines of reckless or frivolous. Oh, lighten up a bit. You only live once. 
Audio 4.9. Yeah, but don't you think this is all a bit... I don't know... Carefree? Adventurous? No, I was thinking more on the lines of reckless or frivolous. Oh, lighten up a bit. You only live once. Audio 4.10 1. thought about this, and the only solution is to reduce costs, and relocating the whole company to our northern office is the best way to do that. But that's nearly 500 kilometres away. Some of the staff in this office have been with the company since the 1980s. Their lives and the lives of their families are in this city. You can't just suddenly expect them to move to the other end of the country. There must be an alternative. I'm afraid I think you're missing the point here. If we don't do something, the whole company will go under. Perhaps if I could just say something here... It's nearly four o'clock now. That means we have another hour and I'm keen to make a decision today. So perhaps if we just take a short break and then we can come back with a clear... Two. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your offer. I'm certainly interested in the opportunity. I just have a small problem with the conditions. Could you expand on that a little, Graham? Sure. Well, in my current post, I actually get 24 days leave a year, whereas you're offering 20. I'm afraid 24 days is out of the question. OK, well, do we have any room for negotiation here? We could maybe take it up to 22. I could put that to human resources and see what they think. I'd be very grateful if you could. Now, in terms of my salary, I was thinking that maybe... Audio 4.11 I'm not sure we can accept that. If I could add something at this point? We'd like to make a decision at this meeting. What exactly do you mean by that? Would you be open to a reduction in? No, I don't see that at all. That could work for us. Audio 4.12 1. He's really dependable and trustworthy. If he says he'll do something, he will. Two. OK, I admit it. It was me who left the printer on all weekend. I'm sorry. Three. OK, so the emergency team are the people who have to coordinate in the event of a fire, for example. It's up to them to call the police and fire brigade, evacuate the building and check everyone is out. Four. If you don't look enthusiastic, how can you expect your team to feel excited about their work? I'm sorry, but I think the problem with motivation in the department is really down to you. 5. So if you need a room for a meeting or anything, the person you have to speak to is Joe. 6. Don't let me down here. I told the others you'll definitely have the report finished by Monday and I'm depending on you to do so. Audio 4.13 The first patient to be treated with antibiotics was a policeman in Oxford who developed sepsis after he pricked himself on a rose. Audio 4.14 Dull Peaceful Adventurous Reckless Slim Underweight High risk Challenging Curious, nosy, 
frivolous, carefree. Audio 5.1 The sun. It wakes us up in the morning, provides us with light and heat, and if it were a person, it would be about 40 years old. The sun is, in fact, around 4.5 billion years old, and it's about halfway through its life. At some point in the future, probably in about 5 billion years, the sun will start to die. In practical terms, the sun is a star located about 150 million kilometers from Earth. It's made up of hydrogen and helium. At its equator, the sun completes a rotation every 26 days. But the sun means much more to us than this. Look at any of the ancient cultures, and you'll find the sun has an important role. There are over 3,000 structures in dozens of countries, from Stonehenge in England to the Mayan pyramids, from the dancing stones of Kenya to solar temples in India. Each of the constructions shows our fascination with the sun. The sun was worshipped by Aztecs, Incas, Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. We can only guess at some of the details, but all we know is that the sun was worshipped across the whole planet. Both the sun and the moon influence humanity's view of time, and calendars have been based on each of them. Many people today still associate a suntan with health and well-being, but in the past, this was certainly not always the case. Back in the 16th century in Europe, very pale skin was considered beautiful, and some people would either stay out of the sun completely or use lead oxide and arsenic, two highly toxic chemicals, to achieve the desired pale effect. As you can imagine, neither of the two was very good for you, and poisoning was not uncommon. Today, however, some people have more than enough exposure to the sun, and visits to tanning salons are not uncommon. In the USA alone, some 22 million customers visit them. The sun is vital to life on Earth. All plants depend on sunlight for photosynthesis, and in turn, plants are vital for feeding humans. Neither plants nor humans could exist without the sun. Without enough exposure to the sun, the body fails to generate vitamin D, which helps to regulate both the immune system and the correct functioning of proteins and minerals. Aside from this, a number of other bodily functions such as our internal body clock, nervous system, and state of mind all depend on exposure to the sun. Audio 5.2 1. Look at any of the ancient cultures, and you'll find the sun has an important role. 2. The sun completes a rotation every 26 days. 3. Each of the constructions shows our fascination with the sun. 4. All we know is that the sun was worshipped across the whole planet. Audio 5.3 1. There's loads of light in the house. 2. Some people might think there's a lack of privacy. Anyone can see inside. 3. One problem is where to put cupboards and shelves. With all those windows, there's a real shortage of wall space. Audio 5.4 1. What's that you're taking? It's a new vitamin complex pill. I came across it in the health food store. What's it supposed to do? Well, it says on the box... Uh, it builds up your immune system. It helps prevent colds and other minor ailments. It supplies all of your daily recommended dose of vitamins A, D and E. <laughs> Sounds like just what I need. It sounds too good to be true to me. Ah, uh, no, that's where you're wrong. Vitamins are good for you. 
Vitamins may be, but I'm not so sure that vitamin supplements are. Well, I don't know about that, but I think it's a good idea. Two. I've just discovered I've put on two kilos. I've got to do something about it fast. Okay. If you're really serious about getting fit, you could take up running. You know, do five kilometers a day. You could start running one a day and build up. Ah, oh, no, you're kidding, aren't you? That sounds too much like hard work. I guess so. You've got a point there. Perhaps you should try cutting down on fatty food. You do eat fries with everything. You're absolutely right. Now, where's that article I was reading last week on superfoods? Here it is. Yeah, look, it says here you should cut out potato chips, fries, and that sort of thing, and eat more superfoods. Superfoods? What are they? You know, things like blueberries, grapefruit, pistachios. Really? I had no idea there were such things as superfoods. But you can't live on those alone. You need to be sensible, or you'll never keep it up. Audio 5.5 A scarcity of A complete lack of An excess of A shade of A significant amount of Audio 6.1 1. Would you be interested in playing games like this? Well, I'm not so sure. I'd have thought that the games would turn out to be pretty dull. When I was at school, the teachers would make us do these educational games, and I ended up having a deep hatred of them. <laughs> I think most gamers would say that they play games because they enjoy them and get a buzz out of them, so the games would have to be much better than the ones they play already. 2. I would have loved to know about these sites before. You know, so much money and resources and creativity go into these games. And I've often asked myself, wouldn't it be good to use those resources in a constructive way? I've always felt rather guilty about playing games, especially when it's two in the morning and I'm still online and I have to get up for work the next day. So to be able to feel that I was helping out in some way would be great. Maybe knowing these games are helping the world in some way would make me feel less guilty. 3. I think you've actually played one of these games. That's right. That's interesting. Would you tell us what happened? The thing is, when I started playing, I didn't realise it would get so addictive. And that's important, because, let's face it, most people would sooner spend their time gaining points than saving the planet. I don't think anyone would play these games if they weren't high quality in themselves. 4. Funnily enough, my all-time favourite game is Tetris, which is the simplest, silliest game anybody has ever invented, and these games sound a bit similar. So I wouldn't mind having a go. Mind you, I'm not completely convinced by it. I asked some friends to try them out, but they wouldn't. They'd sooner play shooting games, and I think that would be true of lots of gamers. I don't think they'd be interested in saving a tree. Audio 6.2 1. I'd rather not. 2. Would you give me a hand? 3. She wouldn't say. 4. I always knew I'd be a star. 5. Where would you live if money was no object? 6. I wouldn't have thought so. Audio 6.3 
Mike, the whole idea of having a holiday is quite a modern one, isn't it? That's right.、Uh, until quite recently, people only took one holiday in their lives: their honeymoon.、Uh, <laughs> the idea of leisure is a modern one. In fact, most of the words we use for free time activities are quite new. Even the word "weekend" is said to have been used in its modern sense for the first time as late as the 1930s.、Uh-huh. Most people then worked 60 hours a week over six days. It's strange, isn't it, when holidays and leisure are so important to us now? The idea of lying on a beach, unwinding, and feeling relieved about having got away from it all. But in fact, it seems as though the old bad days of not much free time might be coming back.、Mm, that's right. The amount of time devoted to leisure is dropping, not increasing.、Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, it is reported to have gone down from 48 to 44 hours per week in just 25 years. People are tending to work longer and longer hours. Yeah, I've noticed here at work the number of colleagues who get to December and then complain about not having taken all their holidays for the year. Yes, apparently British workers only take seventy-seven percent of the annual holiday to which they are entitled. That means they work six days a year for free. <laughs> At the end of the year, people always say they would like to have taken all their holiday, but just couldn't get away from their desks. It does seem rather strange. Audio six point four. One. I work in a large school in Perth, Australia. My students are aged between fifteen and eighteen, and most of the time they're really lovely. But you know they sometimes just get on my nerves. So I guess my job is quite stressful, and it's really essential for me to get away from it all occasionally. And the way I do that is jet skiing. Two. I reckon most people wouldn't think plumbing is a very demanding job, and I'm a pretty laid-back kind of guy. There are a few things that drive me up the wall, mainly customers who keep changing their minds. The job's fairly repetitive. Ninety percent of my work is changing taps that have started leaking, so I need to do something that's completely different. My hobby is to go on trips to art galleries. They're very tranquil places, and that's what I need. Three. I get pretty stressed out in my job. I work most evenings and quite a lot of weekends. I get back from the office at eight p.m. at the earliest. If I've got a big presentation to make, I'm a bundle of nerves the night before. My girlfriend's always telling me to reduce my workload. She says I'm always on edge, but I just want to slump in front of the TV and watch the latest detective series. Four. Of course, different people have different ways of chilling out. I think it's important to strike a balance between work and downtime. Being a street cleaner involves a lot of dirt, so I try to get right away from that. My hobby is to find the best or the most interesting restaurants around, and every two weeks or so, I eat out with a group of friends. Five. I really can't bear just lazing around. I have to be on the go all the time. Studies have shown that a change of activity is more important than just doing nothing. For example, if you work in an office like I do, you want to get outside and do something active. But for me, the best way to unwind is karaoke. Audio six point five. One. A small boy swallowed some coins and was taken to hospital. The next day, his grandmother phoned the hospital to see how he was getting on. No change yet," said the nurse. Two. Why did the teacher wear sunglasses? Because the students were so bright. Audio six point six. Good morning, everybody. Today's talk continues our series of talks about different aspects of language. I'd like to start with a joke. <laughs> It's very short.
A small boy swallowed some coins and was taken to hospital. The next day, his grandmother phoned the hospital to see how he was getting on. No change yet, said the nurse. Now, as you will have realised, the joke depends on the fact that the word change has two meanings. Such words are called homonyms, and they're very common in English. This kind of wordplay is widespread in English and in many other languages too. It seems to cut across national and cultural boundaries. I'm sure there are similar jokes in most languages, but despite this, wordplay, as in this joke, is often regarded as trivial and childish. But if you enjoy this kind of wordplay, and many people certainly do, including me. Then you start to think that it must be an important use of language, and certainly one that's worth studying. Indeed, one of the joys of languages like English, which contain lots of homonyms, is that they allow for this kind of joke. Audio six point seven. Of course, plenty of people hate the use of these double meanings. The famous writer and scholar Samuel Johnson called it the lowest form of humour. However, their frequence in the works of many great authors, including Shakespeare, Lewis Carroll, and Vladimir Nabokov, and also in the Greek tragedies, double meanings are found in the literature of ancient Egypt, China, and Iraq, and many other places. Language has often been described as fulfilling two functions. The first is called T communication, with T standing for transactional. This means it helps us to get things done, like ordering a meal in a restaurant. Though if you do not know the local language, it's enough to do this by simply pointing at the menu. The second type is called I communication. Which means interactional. That is to say, language is an aid to building and maintaining relationships. But I think there's a third function, one that we might call P communication, with P standing for play. Just think how much we play with language, have fun with words, inventing new ones or using old ones in new ways. Unlike other aspects of play, until recently, this fun aspect of language was rarely studied seriously. Why should this be so? Children are happy to sing meaningless rhymes in the playground, and so are adults at football matches. Many millions do crosswords and other word puzzles that depend on wordplay. Italians have rebuses. The Argentinians have jeringozo. And the Japanese have shiritori, so we can't conclude that it's a feature of one particular language. Maybe we have simply taken wordplay for granted. Of course, plenty of people. Audio six point eight. What did you think of the film, Marco? Well, I thought it was a bit of a mess. I liked the basic idea, but there were quite a few bits that I just couldn't get my head round. Like what?、Mm, for a start, when was it supposed to be set? I guess it was the eighteen hundreds or something like that. And the plot was kind of strange. At the start, the main female character seems to be a normal woman. Then you realise she's actually some sort of alien. Come on, Amy, that's just daft. Oh, I thought the bit when we found that out was great. You can't expect a story like that to be realistic. It's called cowboys and aliens, right? Yeah, I suppose so. But something else I didn't get: how did the hero know about the alien ship? I found it a bit confusing, and pretty silly. There were loads of times when I thought this is for teenagers. Well, that's the whole point. It is for teenagers. How about you, Ross? No, I wasn't confused. I was just bored. I thought it was pretty awful. There was something about the story that was really mechanical, formulaic. 
I felt the characters were all, you know, just like robots. There was nothing new or original about anything they did. What a waste of time. Isn't that funny? It's as if we've seen two completely different films. I thought it was great. I agree there were one or two twists in the plot, but I liked the characters. And what about the stuff at the end where the heroine sacrifices herself? Wasn't that really (laughs) heart-wrenching? That just made me laugh. (sighs) I finally realised it was a comedy. (laughs) It was a comedy, right? Audio 6.9 1. I didn't enjoy it. The food ran out, so it was a bit of a disaster, really. 2. The palace belonged to a duke or a lord or someone like that. 3. There's extra stuff on the DVD, like interviews with the actors, some scenes they didn't use and that sort of thing. 4. The shareholders' meeting was actually quite exciting. One or two people got up and started shouting while the CEO was speaking. 5. She played in a couple of matches and then had to retire because she had something wrong with her leg. It was rather sad, really. Audio 6.10 1. It was a bit of a disaster, really. 2. A duke or a lord or someone like that. 3. Interviews with the actors, some scenes they didn't use and that sort of thing. Four. One or two people got up. Five. Something wrong with her leg. Audio 6.11. Why is the flight so delayed? It's difficult to understand. It looks like there's a problem with the plane. I heard an announcement saying there was a technical fault. You always get announcements when something goes wrong, but they never give you useful information. It's frustrating. There was some information on the screens a few minutes ago, but it's gone now. Audio 7.1 The idea that we can be fooled by our feelings, is that an area that has been proved by research? Yes, there is considerable evidence that indicates we can be tricked by our emotional responses. I heard recently of a piece of research by Cornell University about eating. Eating? Hmm. Let me explain. I want you to imagine this scenario. Supposing you were asked to judge a meal in a restaurant... What do you think the answer would depend on? The taste of the food? The look of the food? No. In this experiment, 139 customers were asked to rate the tastiness of their meal at an Italian buffet, but half of them had been told it cost $4 and the other half $8. The ones who had the more expensive so-called meal rated it 11% higher. And this was because the ones who ate the cheaper meal reported loading up their plates and then feeling guilty about it, leading to the negative results. So had they thought they were eating a more expensive meal, they would have answered differently. That's right. And of course, companies and brands spend a huge amount of time and energy finding ways to exploit these emotional responses. For example, how do you get someone to like you? Uh, maybe I'd do something nice for them? No, the opposite. You get them to do you a favour. Because it turns out that if you do someone a favour, you'll like them more. Why is this? The answer is the brain is thinking like this. I am doing this person a favour, therefore I must like them. And a lot of very successful companies actually play on this kind of psychological trick. How do you mean? Okay, Uh, the most famous example is the furniture company IKEA, 
which sells you the different parts of the table or cupboard or whatever and asks you to build it. You feel you are doing the company a favour, and so you start to like them more. It's actually got a name, the IKEA effect. If the company had built the furniture as well, you might not feel so good about them. Strange, isn't it? Once again, you're fooled by your feelings. Audio 7.2 1. Am I apathetic about politics? Older people often say the young are apathetic about politics nowadays, but I don't think that's true at all. We're just not interested in the same things they are. 2. When do I feel apprehensive? Let me think. I'm always a bit apprehensive when I have to disagree with my boss about something. Sometimes he's happy to listen to suggestions, and other times he's not. 3. The last time I was astonished. That would have been when I won the award for Employee of the Month. I was absolutely astonished, because I never win anything. 4. I can't think of a time I felt devastated. But I know that my friend Alexander's family were devastated when he gave up a great job in a bank and became a clown. They thought he was throwing away a really well-paid career. 5. When did I last feel envious? Well, when my sister bought a brand new car, I was a bit envious. Mine's ten years old now. 6. Well, yes, I can definitely think of one time I felt frustrated recently. It was when my brand new laptop kept crashing while I was trying to write an important assignment. Very frustrating. I took it back to the shop and demanded my money back. 7. I'm rarely indifferent about things. I find it's hard not to be affected by other people's problems when I hear about them in the news. 8. What do I find irritating? I got very irritated with the road repairs outside my house last month. They started at 7 o'clock every morning, including Saturdays. Awful. 9. Relieved? Definitely. I was very relieved when my 10-year-old son arrived home yesterday evening. He was over an hour late and I was getting very worried. He'd been playing football with a friend and hadn't noticed the time. Typical. 10. I tend not to get self-conscious these days, but I have a young colleague who was very self-conscious when he had to give his first presentation last week. You could tell he wasn't relaxed in front of all those people. 11. I suppose the most sympathetic person I know is my sister. She'll always listen to people when they have a problem and try to help them. I don't think I'm very sympathetic, though. I rarely have people telling me their problems. 12. What makes me uncomfortable? Well, I'll tell you. It's when my wife's family get together. They love to sing round the piano, and that makes me really uncomfortable. I can't sing very well, you see. Audio 7.3 Today's episode of Fooled by Our Feelings concentrates on embarrassment. Most people don't like being embarrassed, but we certainly remember it when it happens. I think we can all recall those excruciating moments when we wished we hadn't said or done something. But since embarrassment is a powerful force that nearly everybody experiences, I think it's worth trying to understand. Why are we so quick to feel an emotion that makes us so uncomfortable? On the plus side, one reason is that embarrassment fulfills an important social function. After all, we humans live in groups, and it helps our social living if we have a way of saying, oops, I shouldn't have done that, when we go against what people think is normal behaviour. If you break or depart from a social norm, then it helps to maintain good social relations if you show you're embarrassed. But also, people like us more when we show embarrassment. 
I know it's surprising, but there is plenty of research which shows that, for example, if you praise somebody and that person goes very red, you're more likely to find that person trustworthy. Of course, embarrassment does have its dark side, so to speak. As we know, the desire to avoid embarrassment is very strong, and it can lead to real-world consequences. One common situation is that maybe you have some embarrassing health problems, and you think, well, I'd rather other people didn't know about this. Maybe it will just go away. So perhaps you don't even go to the doctor, and that could lead to more serious health problems. Furthermore, at the very extreme level, severe embarrassment can make people avoid social situations and even not go out at all. However, the good news is that we judge ourselves much more harshly than other people do. When volunteers were put in embarrassing situations, researchers found that observers were much kinder on them than they expected. So maybe it's time we stopped worrying about being embarrassed and accepted it as part of everyday life. After all, in most cases, it's not as if what we've done really matters. Audio 7.4 One area that is particularly likely to produce embarrassment is that of language. And this is especially true when you're talking in a second language where maybe you don't quite understand the power of a phrase or the exact meaning of a word. We asked some foreign language speakers about their experiences. Yeah, I was invited to dinner at somebody's house, and I used to smoke, and I asked the host, do you mind if I smoke? And she replied, I'd rather you didn't, and my English wasn't very good then, uh, and I thought that I'd rather you didn't, meant uh, she didn't mind, like uh, it was the same for her. So I lit a cigarette, and she didn't say anything. But later, another guest explained to me that that expression is really quite strong. It means basically, no, you can't. So, at the end of the evening, I went to her and said I was really sorry. My English was very bad, and I could only apologize for what I did. Yes, we had a very important man staying in our hotel, and he was like a VIP, a very important person, and he had this unfortunate habit of sleepwalking. And he would go out of his hotel room and walk down the corridor, fast asleep. And this woman, another guest in the hotel, she came to reception one day and actually complained about the guy who was sleepwalking. And I said to her, Well, really, there is nothing we can do because he's a lunatic. Because lunatic is the Russian word for sleepwalker. Do you understand? And the woman said, Well, I think it's time you stopped letting lunatics stay here. And then I remembered that lunatic means something completely different in English. So I had just told the guest that this VIP guy was a madman. Audio 7.5 1. What would you do if your boss criticized your work in front of your team? That would really embarrass me. I'd probably go bright red and feel awful. It would be a bit humiliating. 2. How would you feel about your neighbours having big noisy parties all hours of the night? Well, I know I wouldn't be able to sleep, so then I'd get annoyed. If they ignored my protests, I'd get really mad and we'd probably end up shouting at each other. 3. Just imagine you arrived at the check-in desk at the airport and you were told that your flight was overbooked and you couldn't board. Oh, that would be awful. I'd be so angry. But I'd try to stay calm, not get angry, and think about what to do. Maybe I'd demand an upgrade on the next flight. 4. What if your neighbour had a dog that barked all day and night? How would you react? Oh, I wouldn't be able to stand that. I work at home and it would drive me mad after a while. 
Five. What if your boss was in a terrible mood and shouted at you for no real reason? <laughs> I'd try to keep out of his way. I'd know it wasn't directed at me. It was simply that he'd lost his temper about something. He'd probably apologize afterwards. Six. How would you react if your manager praised you in front of your colleagues? To be honest, I'd be amazed, as he never praises any of us, even when we win a big order. Audio 7.6 1. OK, so here are the house rules. We all have to agree to them, otherwise it will be chaos. OK, fair enough. Let's have a look. Um, mm, I'm not sure about number four. All house members must clean the kitchen at least twice a week. Is there a problem with that? Well, that's not really fair on someone like me, who probably won't be using the kitchen very much. Maybe if I could be excused the kitchen duty, then I might do more of something else. How does that sound? <sighs> yeah, maybe. Provided we don't have to change everything. I'd rather we didn't start making too many special rules for individual people. Mm, that sounds fair enough. I'll tell you what, supposing you let me off the kitchen cleaning, I could do more of the cleaning of the rest of the house. OK, we might be able to make an exception in this case, but I'll have to ask the others if that's OK with them. 2. OK, so we had a look at your car, Mr Jones. Right. Is it bad news? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there's nothing seriously wrong with it, but there's quite a lot of small things that need doing. OK. That doesn't sound too awful. Can you give me an idea of how much you think it's going to cost? We reckon about £500. £500? Oh, right. That's a lot more than I expected. You did say just small things. Frankly, I'm not really happy with that. Well, like I say, there's quite a lot to do. Actually, the other places I've taken it to have given me a much better price. Oh, right. Well, maybe we could... Uh... Uh, what if we were to bring it down a bit? Well, it depends what you mean when you say bring it down a bit. What did you have in mind? How about 400? If we did the more important things and left the smaller things for another time? How'd you feel about that? OK, that sounds reasonable. I could go along with that. Audio 7.7 .7. Making suggestions and offers If I could be excused the kitchen duty then I might do more of something else. Supposing you let me off the kitchen cleaning, I could do more of the cleaning of the rest of the house. What if we were to bring it down a bit? Clarifying. Is there a problem with that? What do you have in mind? What did you have in mind? It depends what you mean when you say bring it down a bit. Making adjustments to an offer. Provided we don't have to change everything. We might be able to make an exception in this case. Accepting and not accepting. That sounds reasonable. That sounds a bit much. I could go along with that. I'm happy with that. I'm not really happy with that. Other. How does that sound? How do you feel about that? I'll have to ask the others. Audio 7.8 1. This kind of boss I call the volcano. Most of the time they're dormant and they go about their business quietly and peacefully. 
and then occasionally something gets on their nerves and they erupt. The problem is this reduces everybody's productivity because they're walking on eggshells all the time. 2. It's very frustrating for employees when they don't get feedback on their performance. You're thinking, the new sales rep is doing well, but if you don't let them know, they'll just start floating along. By the same token, if you do have to criticise, make sure that your criticism is informational. I mean, the employee needs to know what and why they're doing wrong and how they can improve. Keep it objective. This kind of boss is the motivator. 3. This kind of boss is sometimes called a social director. This means they always try to reach a consensus in their team. They want to create a community. The positive side of having this kind of boss is that they consult with everybody before they make up their mind about something. On the other hand, it takes them a long time to do it. Audio 8.1 they're made of plastic. This is good because it means they're lightweight. The lenses are rigid and obviously they're transparent, so I can see where I'm going. But because they're plastic as opposed to glass, they're a lot tougher and far less fragile and there's less danger of them breaking. The strap is made of some type of flexible plastic or rubber and they're elastic, which means they fit well and don't let water in. Audio 8.2 They're made of plastic. This is good because it means they're lightweight. The lenses are rigid and obviously they're transparent, so I can see where I'm going. But because they're plastic as opposed to glass, they're a lot tougher and far less fragile, and there's less danger of them breaking. The strap is made of some type of flexible plastic or rubber, and they're elastic, which means they fit well and don't let water in. Audio 8.3 when the Royal Swedish Academy awarded the 2010 Nobel Prize for Physics to two scientists from Manchester University, they described their discovery as having a vast variety of practical applications, including the creation of new materials. Some people say that their work could represent as much of a change to humanity as plastic did in the past. But what is it? Its name is graphene. Graphene has a unique set of physical properties. It's really quite simple, because graphene is carbon, a one-atom-thick layer of carbon that makes it the thinnest material ever discovered. But what else is special about graphene? Well, it's an excellent conductor of heat and electricity. It's tougher than a diamond and stronger than steel. It's also very elastic, and can stretch up to 20% its original length. Because of all this, it's guaranteed to revolutionise the production of hundreds of household objects. With graphene, scientists say we'll be able to produce a new generation of flexible phones and tablets. In just a few years, they're likely to be putting digital devices like phones inside your clothes, windows and walls. And you may well be able to read a display inside a transparent material like glass. But graphene could also help in the fight against diseases such as Alzheimer's and cancer, because scientists believe it could help both in diagnosis and in new types of phototherapy. And if all this is true, graphene is sure to be as important for the 21st century as plastic was for the 20th. Audio 8.4 OK, Sylvia, so first of all, can you tell us why you decided to give up plastic? First, I think I should point out that what I've been trying to do is cut down on my use of plastic. It's pretty difficult to cut it out completely these days, 
but I was interested to find out if I could significantly reduce the amount I used. And what made you decide to do this? Well, I was already aware that a huge proportion of my rubbish at home was made up of plastic, but I guess the main thing was that I saw something in a magazine about this massive island of waste plastic in the middle of the ocean. It was really horrifying. When I saw the photo, I decided I couldn't just sit there, so I found out about some people who were trying to, you know, do something about it. By reducing the amount of plastic in their lives? Exactly. And that's why I decided to see how much I could reduce my plastic consumption in a month. So, having made the decision, what was... Audio 8.5 ...in a month. So, having made the decision, what was the first thing to go? Well, I thought I was doing OK. You know, I'd been using reusable bags for my shopping for ages. But I started taking a closer look at all the packaging food comes in before you even put it in your bag. What, you mean like plastic on pre-packed meat and plastic egg boxes and things like that? Yeah, though being allergic to eggs, that wasn't a problem for me. But yes, for example, cheese is wrapped in plastic. Fruit comes in plastic bags. I worked out that I was producing three bags of rubbish a week just from packaging. It's completely crazy. Yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> then there's all those plastic water bottles we seem to get through now. So many people just seem to drink up, throw it out and buy another one without even thinking about it. Now I just use a glass or a metal bottle. OK, so you've been trying this out for four weeks now. Since giving up, or, or rather cutting down on plastic, do you think you've ended up spending more? Well, I've gone over to shopping more in local shops rather than supermarkets, but I think it's probably more a question of time than money. I mean, doing the shopping takes up more time, but the quality of the experience also goes up, you know? You get to actually have conversations with people when you use smaller shops. Mm. And given the choice, I think many people would prefer to buy their fruit and veg direct from the producer or from a local shop where you know it hasn't travelled thousands of miles. So you're at the end of the initial experiment. What next? Do you think you're going to keep it up? Definitely. No doubt about it. Looking back, it's hard to think why I hadn't tried it before. It's really just a question of changing a few habits, becoming a little more aware. Taking everything into consideration, it's been a great experience. Audio 8.6 A What I've been trying to do is cut down on my use of plastic. It's pretty difficult to cut it out completely these days. B Doing the shopping takes up more time, but the quality of the experience also goes up. Audio 8.7 Something I've had to put off. Well, actually, last year I had to change all my holiday plans because of work. What happened was, my wife and I had been planning a trip to the USA for ages, and we were really looking forward to it. We'd always wanted to do a road trip, you know, just book the flights, get there and then set off down the highway, stopping whenever and wherever we felt like it. I've had friends who've gone on similar trips and had a fantastic time. But then something that we weren't expecting came up. One of the companies we do a lot of business with asked for a big order that needed to be sent out as soon as possible. There was nothing for it. I had to put my trip off and get on with fulfilling the order. We worked really hard and got the order out on time. The company was so pleased they placed a second big order and then another. By doing this one rush job, we've been able to build on the relationship and they now give us at least one big order per month. And in the end, we were able to have our trip just a few weeks later than we'd planned. We got to New York and set off heading west. It was a fantastic trip. I'll never forget it. Audio 8.8 .8. Much of what we do in business, as well as outside work, is concerned with human interaction. 
It's therefore very important to understand some basic principles. Whenever we speak, whether we know it or not, all kinds of unspoken or non-verbal signals are being exchanged. Of course, a lot of this is down to instinct. It's quite unconscious and we often both deliver and receive these signals without being aware we are doing so. The study of non-verbal communication, or kinesics, is vital to management and leadership and to all aspects of work and business where communication can be seen. By becoming aware of our body language, the way we move, our facial expressions and the effect it has on other people, we have in our hands a very powerful communicative tool. One very interesting... Audio 8.9 Things to concentrate on while listening Listening is very intense if you try to understand everything you hear. When we listen, it's important to distinguish between important and less important information in order to understand the message. We can do this in two ways. Focus on the stressed words which tend to carry information. Become aware of the low-key intonation used for the words we can ignore, usually because they contain repeated or irrelevant information. For example, much of what we do in business, as well as outside work, is concerned with human interaction. Audio 8.10 Whenever we speak, whether we know it or not, all kinds of unspoken or non-verbal signals are being exchanged. Audio 8.11 By becoming aware of our body language, the way we move, our facial expressions and the effect it has on other people, we have in our hands a very powerful communicative tool. Audio 8.12 One very interesting aspect, of which most of us are unaware, is mirroring. Mirroring is when one person copies the body language of another. If one person sits forward, the other person sits forward and so on. Mirroring is a non-verbal way to say, I am like you, I feel the same. Making this kind of connection, or bond, will help us develop a good relationship with the other person who will, as a consequence, perceive us as being friendly. Audio 8.13 But mirroring, or the chameleon effect, as it is sometimes known, is not restricted to body language. People also mirror voices. In an effort to make a positive impression on another person, to show they're on the same side, the brain can cause people to adopt characteristics of their speech style, including intonation and speed of speech, and even alter their accent to fit that of the person they are talking to. So, if we want to build understanding and trust, as of course we do when we're trying to get a new customer or sell a product, we need to use all the tools at our disposal. Become aware of kinesics, body language and facial expressions and think about mirroring. There's no better way, according to research, to win a customer over. Audio 8.14 Right, the first card I'm going to choose is... Well, I think it's probably, it's a library card. I think it might be a university library or something like that. And the second one is one of those ID cards that business people wear around their neck. So both cards are used for the purpose of identification. With the first one, you'd be likely to use it to identify yourself. 
But I guess it would also have the additional function of recording, perhaps, the books that you've borrowed and the books that you have yet to return. But I think the other one is one of those cards that you have when you're a visitor. So this person could be some kind of visitor to the building, to the office, and has to wear this card to identify themselves as someone who is permitted to be there. I suppose with the first one, the card would enable you to borrow books and obviously to use the facilities of the library and to study there, while the second one would simply enable you to access the building. In terms of how I'd feel about using a card in each situation, well, I wouldn't have any issues, I guess. Particularly in the example of the library, it seems to me to be something very practical. It's nice to see the digitalization of that kind of resource now. I think it's a lot more efficient, so I wouldn't have any problem with that. When it comes to the ID card for the office, I have to say, whenever I've had to wear one of these, I've found them pretty uncomfortable. They're difficult to get on your clothes. But I suppose, you know, it's practical. It's important that people can identify who should and shouldn't be in the building. So I think in both cases, the use of the card is practical and justified. Audio 8.15 Bound to Unlikely to Guaranteed to Likely to Might Sure to Audio 8.16 Absorbent Durable Elastic Flexible Strong Fragile Lightweight Magnetic Rigid Biodegradable Tough Transparent Versatile Water-resistant Audio 9.1 I've just finished reading a book by Ken Robinson about how schools are killing off children's creativity. It really made me think. All the stress about exams and grades could be stifling children's creativity. Mm. In some ways, it's really sad... According to him, right now, in a classroom somewhere in the world, a child will be losing their excitement about new things and enthusiasm for learning. I think it's true that children won't learn what they aren't interested in. Oh, you're right there. Yes, but it wasn't just that. He was saying that this is actually causing a major problem for companies right now, one that experts are quite concerned about. What do you mean? Well... He said that in tomorrow's fast-moving world, a company's success will depend on its ability to come up with innovative solutions. But it seems there's a real problem with the way graduates have been taught to think. They are steered towards more practical and technical degrees, but they aren't encouraged to experiment with ideas and make mistakes. I suppose that's true enough. Mm. If schools and universities will focus so much on facts and technology... It's no surprise that many companies can't find graduates who can produce imaginative solutions. But I think we have to remember that students do have to learn some facts. Mm. I mean, 
They can't always just be creative all the time. That might get a bit tedious, too. Anyway, he's not the only one with some interesting ideas on education. I was going to tell you about that talk I saw by Sugata Mitra. Oh, I've heard of him. But aren't his ideas a bit controversial? Well, yes, a lot of people don't agree with him, but he has done some amazing things. Yes, I read about the hole-in-the-wall experiment. Hmm. It sounded intriguing, but I wasn't really convinced it would work. Well, Mitra says if you give a child a computer, it won't be long before he or she starts to use it. That's exactly what he tried out in the hole-in-the-wall experiment. And those kids didn't know how to use a computer before, right? Hmm. Not only that, they didn't know English either. But Mitra says that, left alone, children will come up with a solution to any problem. You know, find out how to do it or learn other things they need on the way. Really? I find that a bit hard to believe. Did it work? Well, it seemed to, for a while anyway. More recently, he started leaving children problems to solve. You know, just asking a question and letting them research it on their own, without a teacher around at all. Mm. And it's amazing what they come up with. To answer a question, the children will have had to work out what they need to do and then visit lots of different websites to find the answers. And they just do it on their own, right? No teacher? Hmm. So how do they judge which sites are worth reading and which are just rubbish? Wouldn't they need some help from someone with that? Um, I can see that is a problem. Something else he told us about was a thing called the granny cloud. Ah, I read about that too. The idea behind that was to encourage the kids, wasn't it? Yes. He claims that just by someone saying something like, uh, your project sounds amazing, will you tell me about it? That's enough to keep the kids enthusiastic. Mm. I mean, we all know it's a good idea to involve as many people in the community as possible. Mm. Then the children feel what they're doing is valued. You can't disagree with that. I'm just not convinced I could leave my class alone with a load of computers and expect them to come up with any answers. Audio 9.2 1. Right now, in a classroom somewhere in the world, a child will be losing their excitement about new things and enthusiasm for learning. 2. Children won't learn what they aren't interested in. 3. In tomorrow's fast-moving world, a company's success will depend on its ability to come up with innovative solutions. 4. If schools and universities will focus so much on facts and technology, it's no surprise that many companies can't find graduates who can produce imaginative solutions. 5. Left alone, children will come up with a solution to any problem. 6. To answer a question, the children will have had to work out what they need to do. 7. Just by someone saying something like, your project sounds amazing, will you tell me about it? That's enough to keep the kids enthusiastic. Audio 9.3 He will keep arriving late. She would always interrupt. Audio 9.4 1. He will always call just as we're sitting down to dinner. 2. She would say that, wouldn't she? 3. If you will stay up late, it's not surprising you're tired. 4. He was a nice guy, but he would always have to have the last word. Audio 9.5 1. I'm sure it won't be long before we see classrooms without teachers. Really? I'll believe it when I see it. 2. You always say you're going to study harder, but it never happens. <laughs> this time's different. You'll see. 
Three. Let me pay for the coffees at least. I won't hear of it. You're our guest. Four. Can you come on Friday? I need to check with my wife. I'll let you know. Five. That'll be Jim now. Hi there. Hello. Ready to go? I'll just get my coat. Six. Morning. I have an appointment with Dr. Graydon. Ah, good morning, Mr. Lambert. If you'll just wait in there a moment, I'll let the doctor know you're here. Seven. If we get everything finished, can we go home early? We'll see. Let's get started. Audio 9.6. To the next slide. The map shows the proportion of the population between 15 and 24 years of age who are enrolled in tertiary education in different countries. Over 170 million students are in tertiary education. The country with the highest percentage is Finland, where around 43% in this age group are studying. The two countries with the biggest increase in students in recent years are India and China. Uh, we believe... Audio 9.7 1. Before you can enrol, you need to send us proof of your level of English. This needs to come from an officially recognised examining body. If you look on the web page, you'll see a list of those we accept. 2. We've got three kids, and in the next five years, they're all going to be going to university. In the past, you had to worry about paying for the accommodation, books and so on. But at least the classes themselves were free. But now we've got to pay this on top of everything else. I really don't know how we're going to afford it. Three. I think in some countries, everyone wants to go to university. But here in Australia, there are a lot of programs which are more practical and combine work and study. That's how I learned to be an engineer. I think employers in many areas value this type of practical experience more. 4. When I finished school, I wasn't interested in studying anymore. I wanted to start work and start earning some money. However, last year I decided I did want to do a degree and I have to say I'm thoroughly enjoying it. My years of work experience are a real benefit and I definitely appreciate the opportunity to study a lot more than I would have done when I was 18. 5. So this is where you log in and then on the left you can see the courses I'm enrolled on. In the centre are the messages I've got from other people on my course and also from my tutors. Look, my psychology tutors uploaded a video for us. And there are also assignments we do online. Audio 9.8 If current trends continue, the number of students worldwide is set to increase by nearly 50% in the next 15 years, with developing economies leading the way, according to a recent report commissioned by UNESCO. Information technology is sure to play an increasing role in higher education. More students will be following blended learning programs, and it seems clear that the use of virtual learning environments is on the point of changing the nature of both local and distance learning dramatically in the very near future. This is also going to lead to the development of more mega-universities, like the Indira Gandhi National Open University in India, which is due to reach 2 million students in the next decade, or the African Virtual University, which works in over 25 different countries. The study predicts that different countries will dominate research in the 21st century and says China will probably have overtaken the USA as the world's main producer of research by as early as 2020, and India will be in the top five. The current trend towards internationalism is also here to stay. The development of offshore campuses is expected to continue, 
and the number of international students is likely to reach 7 million by 2020. But measures may be needed if countries are to hold on to local talent. In Brazil, the government is to fund tuition fees abroad for 100,000 students, on condition that they return home after graduating. Audio 9.9 1. Information technology is sure to play an increasing role in higher education. 2. More students will be following blended learning programs. 3. The use of virtual learning environments is on the point of changing the nature of both local and distance learning. 4. China will probably have overtaken the USA as the world's main producer of research by as early as 2020, and India will be in the top five. 5. The development of offshore campuses is expected to continue. Audio 9.10 Could you tell me about your job and what it entails? Um, well, I'm a managing editor in the English Language Teaching Dictionaries Department. That means that I produce new dictionaries for learners of English. For example, this year we produced our first ever dictionary of academic English for students studying at university or college. Mm. But mostly what we do is we revise and update existing dictionaries, such as the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary. How has the dictionary business changed recently? Well, there are two ways in which it's changed. One is that there's a lot more technology involved and we now have more sophisticated tools for analysing words. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the people who are using our dictionaries. There are many, many more people learning English around the world and they have a really diverse range of needs. The result is that we're putting more and more words into the dictionary. There are also more informal words and more different varieties of English. It used to be just British and American English, but mm -hmm. now we have Australian English, South African English, Indian English, West African English. We have words from all sorts of different places where English is the first language. Mm. What further changes do you foresee? Um, well... Technology is going to go on changing things, because first we had print dictionaries, and then it was print dictionary and CD-ROM. But CD-ROMs are on their way out now, I think, oh. so now it's all about apps and online, and that's going to get even more important. And it'll also change how we produce the dictionaries, because instead of doing a new print edition every five years... We can just keep constantly updating when we're online. Audio 9.11 1. I'm a managing editor in the English Language Teaching Dictionaries Department. That means that I produce new dictionaries for learners of English. 2. This year, we produced our first ever dictionary of academic English for students studying at university or college. But mostly what we do is we revise and update existing dictionaries, such as the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary. 3. There are two ways in which it's changed. One is that there's a lot more technology involved, and we now have more sophisticated tools for analysing words. 4. There are many, many more people learning English around the world, and they have a really diverse range of needs. The result is that we're putting more and more words into the dictionary. 5. There are also more informal words and more different varieties of English. It used to be just British and American English, but mm -hmm. now we have Australian English, South African English, Indian English, West African English. We have words from all sorts of different places where English is the first language. 6. Technology is going to go on changing things because first we had print dictionaries and then it was print dictionary and CD-ROM. 
But CD-ROMs are on their way out now, I think. So now it's all about apps and online, and that's going to get even more important. And it'll also change how we produce the dictionaries because instead of doing a new print edition every five years, we can just keep constantly updating when we're online. Audio 9.12 So how do you go about selecting new words for a dictionary? Well, two ways really. We have a group of readers and they send in new words that they notice. So we use that, but also the people in our team. Well, we keep our eyes and ears open for new things that we read or that we hear in the media. Things that our kids say. <laughs> and of course, we have a word of the year competition where people vote for new words, like selfie, which won a couple of years ago. Oh, yes, I remember that one. Mm. Now, recently there seemed to be a lot of new prefixes around. Could you tell us something about those? Well, I think it's worth saying that a lot of them aren't quite as new as you might think. If you take a very prominent one like E, that was first used in email, and that term was around as far back as 1979, mm. though it didn't really become popular until the early 90s. And did E start being used for other words apart from email right from the start, or is that much more of a recent thing? That's more recent. We introduced E as a prefix in the dictionary in the year 2000, and now we have words like e-reader, e-learning, and actually a very recent one is e-cigarette, which is interesting because it's not about electronic communication, it's broadening the meaning of e. Mm. In fact, there seems to be a bit of a trend for single-letter prefixes. Such as? Well, i for interactive. That's obviously a popular one, particularly as a brand name. Mm. M for mobile, as in M learning. My favourite new one is P book. P book? What's a P book? It's a print book. Really? Mm. So that's now known as a print book as opposed to an e book? <laughs> that's an example of what we call a retronym. A new or modified word for an old thing that now needs clarifying, like snail mail or landline. What about suffixes? Let's see. Gate from the Watergate crisis in the USA in the 70s is still being used in the press for any kind of scandal. Not only in the USA and the UK, but in lots of other countries too. So you have Pizzagate in the UK... Modigate in Italy, Valisagate in Argentina. Then you have Easter, which started off as a political thing. Zapatista and Blairista, meaning a follower of. Mm -hmm. And then became things like Fashionista and Burista. But that's different because here Easter means more like an expert rather than a follower. And one of the latest is Tastic from fantastic, which expresses a rather indiscriminate enthusiasm, I think. So you have things like pop-tastic or shock-tastic recipes. <laughs> it's not a very sophisticated word. <laughs> Audio 9.13 What's a P-book? It's a print book. Really? Mm. So that's now known as a print book as opposed to an e-book? <laughs> that's an example of what we call a retronym, a new or modified word for an old thing that now needs clarifying, like snail mail or landline. Audio 9.14 a report has shown that the trend to start school younger in many countries is far from ideal. A study in New Zealand showed that by secondary school, children who started literacy classes aged five had no significant advantage over those who started aged seven, and if anything, had less positive attitudes to reading. Experts point to European countries such as Sweden and Estonia, where formal schooling is delayed till the age of seven, 
and where children nevertheless display higher levels of academic achievement and well-being. At the Dandelion Forest School, children learn through outside play all year round in sun, rain and snow. Founder Emma Harwood was worried that even preschool was too centred on formal education and testing, and it seems many parents would also prefer to see their children learning through experimentation and play in a natural environment. Aside from being happy and physically stronger, children develop greater autonomy and a wide range of problem-solving and interpersonal skills. According to scientists, the change in circadian rhythms during adolescence means teens with an 8 or 9 o'clock start at school are expected to concentrate at a time which is incompatible with their body clock. In a trial at the Hugh Christie Technology College in Kent, starting school at 11.30 has meant an improvement in attendance, attention and even exam results for students. Many Taiwanese parents fear that their children lack confidence and courage compared to youngsters from other countries. A kindergarten in Taichung has responded to this by including one to two hours of military exercise and gymnastics designed to improve mental and physical strength. The change has been welcomed by parents and the classes have proved to be a sellout. Audio 9.15 The purpose of this presentation is to look at the bilingual education program which has been operational in schools in Madrid since the year 2004. I'd like to start by providing some background to the program and why it was introduced in the first place. Despite being the first foreign language taught in schools for the past 30 years, a lot of Spanish people continue to have quite a poor level of English and for this reason, the regional government decided to launch a project to tackle the issue of language proficiency in Madrid. The project started in the year 2004 with 26 primary schools and was rolled out across the region so that currently 335 primary schools, that's about 44% of the total, are bilingual. Moving on to how it works in practice, in bilingual primary schools, children have two class teachers. Generally speaking, one teaches subjects in Spanish, such as Spanish language and maths, and the other teaches subjects through the medium of English. These include science, arts and crafts, and PE. In terms of the success of the project, on the whole, the results have been positive. Where it works, it can be very good. Children speak with increased confidence and in most cases take official exams and get external accreditation much earlier than previously. However, not everyone sees it in such a positive light. Critics say it's largely been motivated by politics rather than education. And certainly... The effectiveness of the program does depend to a large degree on the capacity of parents to support their children's studies and also on the language proficiency of the teachers in the first place. Because obviously a program of this nature would require huge amounts of funding and there really is, you know, a relatively limited amount of language training available to teachers. The long-term implications of the program remain to be seen. However, there can be no denying that a whole generation of children are going to leave school with a far greater level of proficiency in English than had ever been the case previously. Audio 9.16 1. The type of education connected with the practical skills you need for a particular job. Two. A system of education in which a person works for an employer for a fixed period of time in order to learn the particular skills needed in their job while studying part-time. 
Three. Money lent to a student to pay for the cost of education. Four. An adult student who goes to college some years after leaving school. Five. Official approval given by an organization saying that someone or something has reached a required standard. Six. The money you pay to be taught, especially in a college or university. Audio 10.1 Good afternoon. I'm going to talk to you today about an exciting revolution which is sweeping our world. I notice many of you have smartphones, and some of you are even filming me on them. Don't worry, I'm not going to take them away. See how nervous you got when I just suggested it? But I'm proposing that all these gadgets, laptops, tablets, smartphones, are already out of date. The internet is so last year because we're living in the post-digital age. Let me give you some examples. In a recent art show in London called 512 Hours, the public were required to give up all cameras, recorders, smartphones and even digital watches at the door. The reason for this so-called technology hijack was so the public could better experience silence and mindfulness. The rationale was that because of all our technology, our ability to concentrate is a disaster. Life is short. Art should be longer. Second example. This is an elementary school in Seattle, USA. The home of technology. It's also one of the most exclusive schools in Seattle, where the bosses of the most important technology companies send their kids. So you might expect it to be full of technology. But what do you notice? There are no screens. The kids spend most of their day playing with mud. Third example. This is the biggest rock band in the world, the Rolling Stones. But when I say biggest, I mean highest earning. And here's an interesting fact. In the last two years, the Rolling Stones have earned 16 times more money from their live concerts than from their sales of CDs and downloads. 16 times! OK, so what am I saying here? Conventional wisdom is that the internet and smartphones are changing our world. We only access the world through our screens. We are losing human contact. But in fact, the opposite is true. Everything live is booming. Big rock festivals sell out in minutes, even at £300 a ticket. Live conferences, seminars, cookery courses, musicals. These activities should be obsolete, but they're actually more popular than ever. Here's a good quote. In the digital age, there is a real necessity for a live experience, for physical interaction. And you can see this happening in what we spend our money on. Purchasing patterns are shifting rapidly from having to being. In other words, from owning new products to buying an experience. Digital is an astonishing means of communication, but it has not satisfied the human appetite for meeting, for touching and for experiencing. I find this hugely reassuring. We still need the live experience. Audio 10.2 1. She's only been working in Copenhagen since January. 2. He's only been writing the draft report. 3. Brazil only scored two goals in the first half. 4. These children only eat fresh food at school. Audio 10.3 1. She's only been working in Copenhagen since January. She used to work just outside the city. 2. He's only been writing the draft report, because the final one isn't due for months. 
Three. Brazil only scored two goals in the first half, but they scored three in the second. Four. These children only eat fresh food at school, and at home they probably eat very unhealthily. Audio ten point four. One. From Nuco, the masters of innovation, a product that will change your experience of gaming, a games console that breaks new ground in terms of performance and price. Two. It's the latest thing in eating out. Come to Blackout, the restaurant where you eat in total darkness. Share a table with strangers who you can't see. You will enter a new world where your other senses, especially taste, will take over. Brilliant food, fine wines, an unbelievable trip, a radical departure in the appreciation of food. Three. This is the story of a man who changed music forever. Buddy Holly was a pioneer in the world of rock and roll, and this biography explains why his music has lived on, unlike other stars from that period whose music now seems dated. Four. Some people are always searching for the last word in design: sofas, tables, bathrooms. But here at Marshall and Company, we look back to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s for the best in retro and vintage. Want a reconditioned radio from 1953? Retro telephones in gorgeous red plastic. Beautiful Italian lamps and lights from the 1970s. Visit our website at retroandvintageobjects.com and just click on the photos. Audio ten point five. The sharing economy is really a very simple idea. You have something that you can share with other people. Let's say you live close to the commercial zone of a big city, where it is difficult to find somewhere to park, and you have a space in front of your house which somebody could park in. Now, out there are thousands of people who work near your house and would be very happy to park in that space and pay for it too. So, the sharing economy is a way of bringing together you and all these people. So, there's a website called Parking Panda which does just that. And in fact, it's the internet which has allowed all these different sites to spring up now. It could be a spare room in your house, and in fact, one of the most successful sites is Airbnb, which allows you to stay in a stranger's house. Or maybe you drive to work and have a space in your car, and somebody would pay you to get a lift to work. So there's a site for that as well. Audio ten point six. So Jack has asked us to come up with some ideas for the new room. What do you reckon? It's quite a big space, isn't it? Personally, I'd go for something that really exploits the space. I think you could be right. It's twenty square meters. Maybe we're looking at something like a table tennis room. We all need to relax. Well, I understand what you're saying, but don't forget that we've got the garden for sporty things like that. It seems like a a bit of a waste of a fantastic facility just to give it over to table tennis. I get the idea from Jack that it should be something serious and work related. Well, one way of keeping Jack happy would be to have some kind of decent meeting room. At present, we have to hold our meetings in that tiny room at the top of the building. I'm not so sure. I agree with you. That room at the top of the building is hardly used anyway. After all, we never really have big formal meetings. We meet up more informally in small groups. That's the company style, if you like. In that case, we could always go Californian and have a chill room, you know, with pods and stuff like that. That would be so cool. Because if you think about it, 
We haven't really got a communal space where workmates can meet up and just hang out. True, and most people I've talked to have said they'd really like something like that. Why don't we suggest a chill room with a cafe attached? That might be a good option. It's a pretty decent space. That's a great idea. And we can sell it to Jack by saying we won't need to keep popping out to the cafe every 10 minutes. Right, so that's decided then. Let's just recap what we've decided. One end of the room will be a chill room and the other end will be some kind of cafe or meeting. Audio 10.7 1. This object was the key to a fundamental shift in the economics of the world because it provided Europeans especially with a reliable method of traversing the world's oceans and this gave Europe the wealth and power that later fueled the Industrial Revolution. Ironic, really, because it was a Chinese invention. 2. I hate to say this, but I think the wristwatch is on the way out. I wanted to buy one for my son's 21st birthday, but he just said to me, Mum, I really don't need a watch. That's a bit last year, or even last century. I just use my smartphone now. It's such a pity, because they can be works of art as well as wonders of science. 3. The first ones appeared in the early 1990s, though they didn't start to get really popular until about 2010. I think the key to their success was in the fact that you operated them with your finger, so there was no need for a mouse or for all that clicking. In that sense, I think they were something genuinely innovative and took computers in a fresh direction. 4. You know when you're in a foreign city and you really, really need to use the internet, so you're constantly looking for a hotspot. Well, this will let you know where all the perfect internet hotspots are. It displays the strength of Wi-Fi signals in your vicinity no matter where you happen to be in the world. Just look down at your chest or ask a passerby how strong your signal is. A great way to make friends. 5. The printing press is a fairly obvious example of a crucial innovation, but I don't think people realise how many different fields of study and behaviour it affected. From religion to science to the arts, it literally changed everything. Of course, as with most inventions, many different people were involved in its development, but it was mainly due to people like Gutenberg in Germany that it became so widespread around Europe. Audio 11.1 Question 1. Africa is home to more languages than any other continent. At the present time, there are about 1,300 languages spoken by over 400 million speakers. There are four main language groups and various lingua francas, languages used for communication between people from different language groups across a wide area. Question 2. The Bow Wow theory states that language is based on imitation, that when language began, our ancestors imitated natural sounds around them, such as animal noises. However, critics say this is unlikely as, while in English children describe a dog's call as bow wow, in China, for example, they call it wang wang. The yo he ho theory says that language evolved from the noises people make while using extreme physical effort. However, as linguists point out, this doesn't account for all the other words in our vocabulary. As yet, no linguists have described the bang-bang theory. Question 3. The answer's logical. It's generally agreed that despite the fact that the brain was increasing in size, early humans didn't start using tools extensively until they started communicating using speech. The reason for this is that until this time, they couldn't use tools because their hands were being used for communicating in gestures. Question 4. Chimpanzees certainly don't have the intellect that humans do, but experiments have shown that they can be trained to work out logical connections and, in the right environment, 
acquire a vocabulary of up to 200 items. However, efforts to get chimps to speak have been a total failure. The reason they cannot speak is simple. Their bodies are not designed for speech. Question 5. By the age of 18, the average person has a vocabulary of some 60,000 words. This means he or she must have learnt an average of 10 new words every day, about one word every 90 minutes. Question 6. The pheno ugric languages are a group of languages which are alike in some respects and share common roots. They are spoken in the north of Europe in Finland, Estonia and parts of northern Sweden and in one country in Central Europe, Hungary. Audio 11.2 1. Can you think of a food which reminds you of your childhood? 2. Is there any ingredient you really don't like? 3. What foreign restaurants are popular where you live? 4. Which is the best region in your country in terms of food? 5. What's the best type of street food in your country? Audio 11.3 Who ever thought of taking day-old tortillas, frying them, and serving them with melted cheese, chilies, and tomato sauce? The answer is Nacho, or to give him his full name, Ignacio Anaya. The story goes that a group of women, the wives of U.S. servicemen, walked into a restaurant in northern Mexico. It was the end of the day, and Nacho threw together a meal with the ingredients he had to hand. The customers were delighted, and nachos, as they became known, were quickly exported over the border into the United States. It just goes to show that no matter what ingredients you have, a tasty snack can be made. Who invented the kebab? It seems whoever you ask, they'll tell you a different story. From Greece to Iran, Turkey to India, everyone is claiming responsibility. However, it does seem likely that the kebab started out as a food for soldiers. While on duty, they would put meat on their swords and grill it over an open fire. Many kebabs today are still cooked horizontally on a metal skewer. However, the modern doner kebab, in which the meat is cooked vertically, is generally agreed to have been invented by Iskender Effendi of Borsa, Turkey. Whichever direction you have your meat cooked, it's sure to be delicious. Pad Thai is arguably the most famous dish to come out of Thailand. A simple dish of rice noodles and meat and vegetables, it's the dish that Thai restaurants around the world are judged on. In Thailand itself, you can find it in every cafe and street stall. Surprisingly, though, the origins of this national dish don't go back that far. Before the 1940s, Pad Thai didn't really exist. It was the Prime Minister of the time who popularised the dish in an effort to promote national unity and advance the country's economy and health. The recipe was rolled out across the country and street vendors were encouraged to make and sell it. It's not known who invented the recipe, although it has strong Chinese influences. Whoever invented it, though, it has undeniably become the national dish of Thailand in a relatively short period of time. Paella was originally an easy lunch dish for farm workers to cook in the fields near Valencia, Spain. Whenever I think of paella, I think of seafood, but this was not one of the original ingredients. It was made with rice, plus anything else found in the surrounding countryside, tomatoes, onions and beans, with some snails, rabbit or whatever. Traditionally, it was shared and eaten straight from the pan. Later, the recipes were refined and seafood was added, and there are now some 200 paella recipes in the Valencia area alone, with many more varieties in other parts of Spain and abroad.
Audio 11.4. Let me introduce my next guest, who is making us a classic Greek dish here in the studio, Eleni Papadakis. You run a small but enormously popular Greek restaurant in East London, and you've also written two Greek recipe books. That's right. And you're making us one of your signature dishes, moussaka.、Mm-hmm. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So tell me, are you following a traditional recipe? It's my version of it, but it's based on the traditional recipe. Okay. So tell us what you're doing. Well, I've already prepared the aubergine layer. I thinly sliced two aubergines, seasoned them with salt and pepper, and brushed them generously with olive oil. They're baking in the oven. What I'm making now is the meat layer. I've roughly chopped up some onions and softened them in oil. Then I added garlic, cinnamon, and oregano, and after that I stirred in the lamb. Then I added peeled tomatoes. You have to peel them as the skin goes bitter if you leave it in the sauce. Tomato puree and red wine. So this now needs to cook gently for at least half an hour to reduce the liquid. Mmm, it smells delicious already. I know it's good, isn't it? Anyway, now I need to make the white sauce for the top layer. So I'm melting the butter with some flour, and now I need to add some warm milk and beat it in. How do you avoid getting lumps? I just beat it vigorously so they don't have the chance to form. Okay, that's done. Now I've grated some pecorino cheese here, and I'm going to melt that into the white sauce. There you go. Now this is what makes the white sauce special. I'm going to beat two eggs into it. The eggs make the sauce rise when it's cooked. It's almost like a custard. Yes, it goes nice and fluffy. And once the eggs are beaten in, I'll season it and add some grated nutmeg. So, Eleni, all three elements are now ready. What are you doing now? I'm putting layers of the aubergines and meat in an oven dish. There, that's done. And the final touch. The white sauce covers the whole thing. Then back into the oven for forty-five minutes. Some people like to sprinkle cheese on top and grill it at the end. Do you do that? No, I add cheese to the sauce. I don't think it needs any more. Well, I can't wait to try it. What would you serve with your moussaka? Audio eleven point five. Okay, so the best street festival in Asia is without any doubt Songkran. No way should you miss this amazing party. Songkran is a major festival in Thailand. It's the celebration of the Thai New Year, and apart from anything else, it's the biggest water fight in the world. It takes place each year in April, which is the hottest time of the year. Originally, the date was determined by the lunar calendar, but now it takes place officially from the 13th to the 16th of April. Although the celebrations can go on for a whole week. Again, going back to its origins, it was a religious festival. And it was all to do with cleaning and making fresh starts. People would clean out their houses. They would clean religious statues, and very respectfully, they would pour water on their family and on their neighbours. Just a little water to symbolise the start of the new year. Now it's all become an absolutely massive street party. And it's totally fine and normal to soak complete strangers. The whole thing is designed to bring you good luck in the new year, and it's a huge party with dancing, drinking, and lots and lots of water. Thai people often go home to their villages, but for visitors, the place where you can have the best Songkran experience is Bangkok. 
It gets really busy though, so you do need to book accommodation well in advance. The city gets incredibly busy, and in terms of advice, well, be super careful with your cameras, your phones, and any other valuables because everything will get wet. While your actual room is probably safe, the staff may attack you elsewhere in the hotel. That's how serious it gets. Don't try and use public transport to get into the centre of town because it's just crazy. You must show respect for the religious elements of the ceremony, which are still there. And what you absolutely have to remember is this. Don't come to Songkran without a bucket or a water pistol because you've got to fight back. Audio 11.6 1. Now it takes place officially from the 13th to the 16th of April. 2. Thai people often go home to their villages. 3. While your actual room is probably safe. Audio 11.7 1. Now it takes place officially from the 13th to the 16th of April, although the celebrations can go on for a whole week. 2. Thai people often go home to their villages, but for visitors, the place where you can have the best Songkran experience is Bangkok. 3. While your actual room is probably safe, the staff may attack you elsewhere in the hotel. Audio 11.8 1. I'll never forget that holiday. 2. The architecture really impressed me. 3. I never thought about the danger we were in. 4. When I got back to the village, I stopped running. 5. The food was the best thing. Audio 12.1 Today's visiting expert is Dan Harrison. Dan, you've been studying the different types of memory. Can you give us just a simple rundown of the different types? <laughs> well, I'll try. But it's a very complex area. There's a lot of debate over how memory works, and a complete understanding of how memory works is a long way off. Work is being done all the time around the world on the brain and how it processes information. I think most people know that memory is basically divided into short-term memory and long-term memory, though there are plenty of experts who disagree even with those two terms. But let's stick with them for now. Can you define those terms? So, short-term memory lasts for just a few seconds, and we know that with short-term memory, most people are able to remember a telephone number of, say, six digits, but not of 26. And that is down to the fact that short-term memory has restricted capacity. Whereas? Whereas long-term memory lasts forever and has no upper limit, as far as we know. But as always, the situation is much more complicated than that. For a start, long-term memory is separated into two types. These are sometimes called implicit memories and explicit memories. Implicit and explicit. That's right. So... Implicit memories are things that you don't have to think about, like riding a bike or playing a musical instrument. Don't some people call this muscle memory? Yes, especially in sports. You do an action so many thousands of times that it becomes unconscious and automatic. But it's not just actions. It can be things you have no control over. An example would be the memory that comes back when we smell fresh bread or taste a chocolate cake. Another crucial point about implicit memories 
is that they often are nonverbal. You find it hard to describe them to somebody. By the same token, with explicit memories, you can get people to describe them. And what's more, you could give details about the situation, such as who was there, what the weather was like, and so on. Audio 12.2 But I think you're going to say that it's even more complex. Absolutely. Because explicit memories are further subdivided into episodic and semantic memories. Obviously, episodic relates to episodes that happen to you. So in our experiments, we had the subjects describe their first kiss, or when they met someone famous, or when they had their car stolen. And that was obviously very easy for them. So what's semantic memory? That's the kind of memory for pieces of information. Like, what's the capital of China? Beijing. Uh, Right. Or the name of a good plumber to call when you have water coming through your kitchen ceiling. Or the name of your hairdresser when you need to get your hair cut. Well, thanks for that, Dan. It's been unforgettable. Audio 12.3 1. He complimented Andrea on the presentation she'd made at the conference. 2. She urged us never to believe the advertisements that say that chocolate is good for your memory. 3. He suggested the management should change the plan. 4. He emphasised the need for older people to retain their independence. 5. She insisted on having Japanese green tea for breakfast. 6. He claimed he had been accepted by a top German university when he was 15. Audio 12.4 Imply Implied Implication Proportion Proportionate Disproportionate Substance, substantial, substantially. Associate, associated, association. Interpret, interpretation, interpretative. Reproduce, reproduction. Reproductive. Fundamental. Fundamentally. Audio 12.5. 1. What makes learning English words so difficult is the pronunciation. 2. Memorizing lists of words I find very unproductive. 3. Can't be bothered with learning words myself. I just listen and then try to use them. 4. I've been learning French for I don't know how long, but I still love learning new words. Audio 12.6 1. People's names. That's what I can never remember. It can be very embarrassing when you meet them again. 2. Always forget my own mobile number, I do. I never phone myself, you see. 3. What I can never remember is the words to songs. But as I can't sing, that's probably a good thing. 4. My pins. You know, the numbers you use for your credit card, phone, and so on. I'm always forgetting those. We have so many nowadays. 5. I've forgotten my parents' birthdays. I don't know how often. 
I forgot my mother's last year and she didn't speak to me for a month. Audio 12.7 What did you think of Professor Glazunov's talk? For the most part, I thought it was very interesting, especially the bit about using rooms. I actually used that technique last year for my final exam. So, how does it work exactly? In that section, I got a bit lost. He went so fast. <laughs> well, the idea is that if you want to remember a lot of different things in order, you imagine yourself in a big house, and each room represents something you want to remember. Or it could be each item in a room represents something. So, let's take the bones of the hand. You have to remember them for a test or something. You associate, say, a vase with the first bone, then a mirror with the second bone, and so on. So, how does that really help? Well, when you want to recall the names, you imagine yourself in the house, and when you see the vase, it triggers your memory of the name of the bone. <laughs> That's the theory, anyway. <laughs> and does it work? Up to a point, I think it does. What they don't tell you is how to remember the objects in the room. You have to keep the picture of the room in your head, and if you've got a lot of things to learn, well, it can get a bit complicated. What really interested me was the research about learning words. The stuff that seems to prove that there's not much difference between learning something by heart and repetition and using other methods. Yes, but there was only one source he cited. What about the research on learning in chunks? That was quite good, especially the bit about learning words in phrases. It appears that's how we remember names. If you can remember their first name, the surname is like part of a chunk, so you remember the name as a whole. Hmm. What did you think about the idea of mind maps? It was good stuff, that. I use mind maps all the time. Yeah, we had a lesson about them right at the start of the course, but it's good to be reminded about these things every now and again, just in case we forget about them. Audio 12.8 Did you read that intriguing story about the man who went swimming in the sea and then lost his memory? No, what was that? I must have missed it. Sounds rather unlikely. It does, doesn't it? But it was on the Guardian website. Apparently, what happened was he was on holiday in Scotland with his wife and grandson. They found this beautiful beach on the Isle of Mull, I think it was, and he and his grandson decided to go swimming. OK. This was in the summer, was it? Yes, I reckon it must have been. But the thing is, Mull is actually quite a long way north. I mean, it looks beautiful and sunny in all the photos, but it's still pretty cold even in the summer. I guess he thought the water would be warmer than it was. Yes, I've been caught out like that in Scotland. The sea always seems to be absolutely freezing whatever the time of year. Hmm. So, anyway, the grandson was wearing a wetsuit. Sounds like a sensible lad. Yeah, but the grandfather was only wearing swimming trunks. Because he thought the water would be warm. That's right. Mm. In fact, it wasn't anything like as warm as he was expecting. After about ten minutes, the grandfather comes out of the water and he can't remember where he is or what he's doing there. What made it really weird was that he could recognise his wife and his grandson and he could do things like dry himself, but all his recent memories were gone. That must have been seriously upsetting. And, oh yes, something I forgot to mention, it was his short-term memory that seemed to be really badly affected. He could only remember new things for 30 seconds, so he kept repeating the same things over and over. He kept asking the same questions. <sighs> Wouldn't that be utterly appalling? I can't think of many worse things to happen out of the blue like that. Mm. So what happened next? Well, his family were really worried, so they decided to take... Audio 12.9 1A An awful thing happened to me yesterday. B 
I had an awful thing happen to me yesterday. 2A He had his house painted. B He had painted his house. 3A I refuse to let you bring your boyfriend home. B I won't have you bringing your boyfriend home. 4A This product is endorsed by several celebrities. B This product is recommended by several celebrities. 5A Please have the next applicant come in. B Please ask the next applicant to come in. 6A We got the neighbours to cut down the tree. B We paid the neighbours to cut down the tree.